So hi, I'm, I'm Martin Robinson, and uh, I'm an Agalian, and I work on WebKit. And I, um, today I want to talk a little bit about uh, the work we've been doing with WebKit GTK, and um, especially I'm going to focus on some practical things for people who embed WebKit, um, some, some changes you'll have to make if you port your application to WebKit too. Uh, and I just want to say, like, to preface this talk by saying that um, for, for us in WebKit GTK, this, uh, this stable release of WebKit 2 is really a, a revolutionary step in the development of the library rather than an, an evolutionary step. It really changed um, a lot of the characteristics of the library. So we're, we're actually really excited about it. So uh, I just want to start with a quick review uh, for those of you who aren't intimately familiar with WebKit, uh, talk a little bit about um, what it is, what it's used for. So WebKit is, is, uh, is what's referred to as a web content engine, which basically means that if you have a web browser, everything inside, inside the Chrome in that little box is uh, rendered web content. And that's, that's what the library is responsible for, as well as some ways in which that content touches the outside world. Uh, so, uh, right, it processes and renders web content. And processing includes both parsing the HTML and the CSS in rendering it, as well as running the JavaScript. So um, it was started as a fork of KHTML. Um, and for a little while, it was, uh, it was closed source. But eventually, it was open source in 2005. And um, uh, on the page, one of the goals of the project is actually that it's open source, that it's a uh, that it is uh, usable and visible to everyone, uh, as well as um, these two sort of companion goals, compatibility and compliance. Compatibility meaning that um, there's a lot of content out on the web and that uh, the, the engine should be able to render that content. It shouldn't break websites that exist. The, actually, the, uh, the criteria for breaking websites it, it has to be something very important, and the websites have to be a very small percentage of, of the sites on the internet. For instance, on the Blink mailing list recently, they were talking about removing a feature, and the feature was used on something like 0.8% of websites, and someone was like, that's a lot. And it is a lot when you have millions and millions of pages. That's a lot of pages. So um, the other part of this is compliance, which means that uh, the engine should be should be um, compliant with the specs. And um, these are kind of uh, competing goals in a way, because sometimes to, to be compatible with pages, you need to, to not be compliant with the spec. So it's, it's always this, this kind of back and forth conversation uh, that we have. Um, uh, obviously, stability and performance are important, because the web browser should be fast, and it shouldn't crash. Um, also, security which I'll talk a little bit about more, but the security issue is, is very important. Portability, it should be written in a way that's, that makes it useful on a lot of systems, not just a Mac, not just an Intel computer. Um, usability and hackability. And hackability is really uh, a statement about the quality of the code. The code should be written in a way that's, that's easily readable, easily changeable. You know? It should be um, abstracted away in, in the right amount, not too much, not too little just enough to make it easily hackable. Um, you never want it to be a, a pain to have to go change the code to fix a bug. Anytime there's a, a barrier in the way, that means less bugs will be fixed. And then they also state on the website some non-goals, which is, in some sense, equally important, because um, sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, you shouldn't be turning this library into a full web browser. It's not meant to be a full web browser. It's meant to be a component that's reusable inside web browsers. So, so there needs to be a dividing line between what features go in the library and what features belong in the embedding application, or the client, we say. Uh, it's also not a science project. It should be, which means that it should be relevant to what exists in the world today. It's made to render web content that exists. It shouldn't necessarily be a place to experiment with things that people will never use or aren't important right now. 
those things um, can be worked out, and WebKit can meet them halfway. Um, the, the third thing here is it's, it's not um, meant to, to be split into a bunch of reusable components, which is kind of, um, in some sense, in contrast with, with GNOME, because a lot of times uh, in GNOME, when we see that there's, there's a piece of GNOME that's useful for a lot of other tools, we you know, split it out into a library. And WebKit, the philosophy is a little different. You know? Every time you split it, uh, something out into a library, there's some overhead in maintaining that. You have more consumers. So it's a little, it's a little bit more, um, I guess, like of a hermit community. You know? We're together working on this thing, and you don't always want to like, split off some useful code. Um, right. So uh, another th interesting thing about WebKit is that it's split into things called ports. Uh, and you can kind of see where this is going. And there's a GTK port, a Qt port, an EFL port, a Mac and Windows ports, which are used on Safari. And ports are, um, are essentially uh, the common WebKit code, which is most of the code is common. And some layer at the bottom, which abstracts away the platform. For instance, networking, or how to draw to a canvas, um, how to talk to the system. Uh, and then that's at the bottom. And then at the top is the API layer. And the API layer is what the embedding application uses. And the way WebKit is, is designed is that every API layer is a little different. So for instance, for the WebKit GTK port, in the platform layer, we use libsu for networking. We use Cairo for rasterization, OpenGL for making the scene graph, which I'll talk more about later, and WebGL, and Dreamer for media. And uh, uh, WebKit's made in such a way that uh, these components in most of the WebKit code are totally abstracted away, into uh, wrapped with classes that have the same semantics, whether you're writing on a Mac or on for GTK. And any time the semantics differ, it's, it's kind of like a little bug that needs to be fixed, usually. Uh, there's always little tricky bits of, of getting the semantics of different platforms uh, to match up. Because a CG canvas, core graphics, isn't necessarily the same as a Cairo canvas. Um, for instance, in Cairo, you store the path on the canvas, but it's a little different uh, in some other platforms. So, uh, and then um, at the top of WebKit GTK, there's the API layer, which is essentially a single uh, GTK widget, the WebKit web view, the, the widget that is the browser, uh, win the window into the, the web content, and uh, some G object APIs around that. Um, and some of the consumers of of WebKit GTK embedders are Epiphany and Bedora, Yelp, DevHelp. Maybe you're familiar with these, these applications. All right, so here's an example of uh, what I was talking about. So this is a, a sort of simplified um, uh, architecture diagram of WebKit. And at the bottom, uh, there's this thing called uh, WTF, um, which uh, is essentially a little bit like Boost. It's a, like a... Uh, it wraps, it, it makes C++ a little nicer to use. It includes some collections, some platform abstractions. It abstracts away like threads. Um, and uh, JavaScript core, which is the JavaScript engine. And these days, uh, now that Blink has forked, JavaScript core is the only JavaScript engine in WebKit. And sitting on top of that is uh, the uh, web core, which includes a platform layer and the rest of web core. And I'm separating those because, again, the platform layer are, are classes that wrap Cairo, for instance, whereas the rest of WebCore are, are, uh, is functionality that's, that's common to all platforms, like the functionality that takes uh, a stream of data and parses out CSS rules. Sitting on top of that is WebKit, um, which is... Um, how do I describe that? Uh, WebKit is, is sort of like the glue between WebCore and the browser. So this includes the API layer, but it also includes um, some code for like handling different situations and sort of translating that into API concepts. That's a little fuzzy, but um, uh, on top of that sits uh, the application. and. Uh, Notice that right, right now in this diagram, again, this is WebKit 1, these are all on the same process. This is just a, a normal uh, library. 
So before I start talking about WebKit 2, uh, I just want to talk a little, a, a, a little bit about the motivation for WebKit 2. Um, so it's a minor philosophical point, which I think is what uh, the, uh, the thinking that drove the creation of Chromium and drove the creation of WebKit 2. Um, and it means that this is the future of the web. So code has bugs that crash the program. Or just bugs. All code has bugs. And uh, code has bugs that allow arbitrary code execution, which um, especially if uh, that code includes um, a JavaScript engine that's writing machine code into memory. Uh, and not only does code have bugs, code has dependencies that have bugs. So maybe, uh, maybe you've written perfect code, but you're using a library like fontconfig or Cairo that has a bug, one of these bugs. Uh, and the fourth point is even if everything was looking good, my, the, your code, the dependencies, you're going to be processing uh, things from the, from the world that you don't trust, that are like little programs, fonts, and images, SVG images. And these are all like small uh, sets of instructions that, uh, that mean that the scope of the data you're processing is wide, and, and the, the chance of, of, of writing a, a font that can, that can crash your browser, actually, I mean, it's it's very hard to, to eliminate these problems. So WebKit 2 is a pragmatic response to this. I mean, maybe you can say that, um, that uh, we're going to work hard and we're going to fix all the bugs in our browser so that it doesn't crash. We're going to eliminate these security issues. But you also have to eliminate the security issues in your dependencies. You also have to work with sanitizing your input data, which is very hard. And, um, Instead, we say, yes, let's keep working on fixing the crashes in the browser. But let's also say that if something goes wrong, let's make sure that it doesn't leave our users vulnerable to attack. So for instance, when we talk about arbitrary code execution, um, one thing to keep in mind is that, um, is that these days, uh, web applications are, are applications. You know? They're like. They're like desktop applications now. And not only are they like desktop applications, like you, you might be running you know, Angry Birds in your browser, and like alongside it is your, your bank account information. And maybe Angry Birds you know, can reach over and touch your bank account. And this isn't like a hypothetical situation. This is, this is things that actually happen. So the web is huge, remember. Um, so this is what we can do. Uh, we can. We can acknowledge that the web platform is huge, and every day it's, it's getting bigger. It's adding more functionality. And each time you add functionality, you add more chances for vulnerabilities, for crashes. And we can, we can think of a way to make the crashes less inconvenient for users. Maybe instead of um, when uh, the web rendering crashes, it doesn't crash the browser. It just crashes that tab, or it just crashes um, the web rendering part. And we can prevent crashes from exposing, crashes in security vulnerabilities from exposing data from, from outside the scope of the current page. And the way we can do that is we can put that data maybe in another address space where it's harder to get to, put some, some more separation between the data of the different applications. Um, and we can also uh, prevent bugs and crashes from damaging the system or executing arbitrary code. Um, that's another name for sandboxing. So even if, even if uh, some page crashes the browser, it can't write to the hard disk, because that process can't write to the hard disk. Um, and finally, even if we're not talking about a malicious page, we're just talking about a, a page that has a really heavy while loop, it shouldn't prevent you from using other pages or clicking a menu. It shouldn't prevent you from closing the browser to get away. So this is the, this is the thinking that drives, to, drives this, because 
to be honest, WebKit 2 and Chromium, these are like very complicated architectures and, uh, and they, they deserve a, a good reason. So uh, this is the end result. Um, we, can, uh, we can put each web rendering part into its own process and then have some parent process. In WebKit 2, we call uh, the web rendering process the web process, and we call the parent process the UI process, because the actual Chrome of the browser is in this UI process. Uh, and we can sandbox the web rendering, because you know once you separate out the web part, it's, it doesn't need to write to the hard disk or even read from the hard disk. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about, about how to make sandboxing easier later. So this is uh, sort of the first WebKit 2 architecture diagram. On the left, you can see the old uh, architecture diagram, a little bit different, but you see the API boundary was uh, between the application and WebKit. And here we have now two processes, and the, the API is, is in the UI process, but underneath that API, it's talking via IPC, the inter process communication, to another process which has the rest of the library. So even if this web, proce web process crashes, it's not going to be able to crash the browser or indeed read um, arbitrary information from the address base of the UI process. Um, and before I go on, are there any questions about this in particular? Because this is, OK, yeah. Pretty simple. This is a, a pretty uh, old concept at this point since Chromium's been around for a few years. So uh, just a few details about what's inside, um, which I think I put this here uh, to make it easier to understand um, the practical bits. Uh, but uh, essentially, uh, we have two processes now. They need some way to communicate. Um, and I, I sort of split those ways into three distinct ones. Uh, the first is messaging. So say the web process reads the browser title, and then it needs to tell the UI process that, oh, yeah, I've read the title, you know, change the title bar to reflect that. Um, it sends a message with some arguments. The arguments in the message are serialized into a chunk of data. It's sent across a socket to the other side, and then deserialized and interpreted. And there's also a shared memory, which is used for sending big chunks of data, like the web process is finished rendering the page to an image, and it sends that. It's too big for, for this socket. It sends that as a chunk of shared memory to the process. We avoid making uh, unnecessary copies. And the third is uh, shared surfaces, um, which are different than shared memory because these typically are on the GPU. The web process has put something on the GPU, and it wants to send it to the UI process without downloading that data from the GPU again, putting it in shared memory, and then re-uploading it. Uh, so for instance, in, uh, in the X11 version of WebKit GTK, we use X composite and X damage, sort of like we make a little window manager, uh, and we send uh, these GPU services to the, uh, the UI process to render. Uh, and why do we have to do that? Uh, that's because um, web pages these days, more and more, are just uh, scene graphs, like clutter scene graphs, um, for three main reasons. The first is that we want to prevent uh, we want to prevent uh, unnecessary redraw. Say, like some div is moving, animating on top of the rest of web content. Only this div is changing, and maybe just only even the position. So instead of constantly re redrawing the entire page. What if we just stored all the different layers of the page into textures and just recomposited those textures uh, on the GPU again? And the GPU is actually really good at compositing, it turns out. So uh, uh, it, it's quite fast if you do it cleverly. Uh, the second thing is 3D C CSS transforms. Uh, the way those work usually is that they're done on the GPU with OpenGL. And, and so um, once, you, once you start doing work on the GPU, it's really, really expensive to stop and bring it back into main memory, only to re-upload it again so you can display it. 
that's actually enough to kill your frame rate. So, so it, it's sort of a non-starter to, to do that. And the same with WebGL. WebGL, obviously, is OpenGL, which is on the GPU. Downloading it again, downloading and re-uploading it again will bring the frame rate below the, the limits of the human eye. So, um, right. so the way it works is that the scene graph is built and processed in the web process. Uh, in the web process. And uh, once the scene graph is there and all the rendering is there, you do the compositing there, and you, you need some way to send those results to the UI process. And that's where xComposite and xDamage comes in, sort of like the way an application does all the rendering and sends it to the window manager. Uh, and the way this will work in Wayland is probably that uh, we'll use a, uh, a, an embedded uh, Wayland compositor. We're still working that out. All right. So that's sort of um, the high-level overview of WebKit 2. Um, and um, in GNOME, we, we end up embedding uh, WebKit in a few places. So um, some of you may be asking, um, should I port my application to WebKit 2 if you use WebKit GDK or even any other port of WebKit? And the answer is yes. You should port your application to WebKit 2, um, in fact even if you don't think it will be useful. The reason is uh, WebKit GDK is moving into maintenance mode. So it turns out that uh, it takes a lot of work to maintain a WebKit port. So when your team has to maintain two, it's a little bit harder. Um, in addition, uh, WebKit, GDK, WebKit 1 will be deprecated at some point, because once you stop maintaining WebKit, then you start worrying about security vulnerabilities and fixing new bugs. So uh, the good thing about this is that WebKit 2 is a better API. Um, it's richer. It exposes more functionality. It's more in line with other WebKit, WebKit ports. Um, it's just all around a better API, because it's the second time around we made an API. So we got a lot better at it. Um, and on top of all that, if you port your application to WebKit 2, Without doing anything other than porting it, it'll be faster, more responsive. When some random web content crashes WebKit, it won't crash your application. You can just restart it. It's, it's very nice. All right. But it's not necessarily easy for all use cases. Um, some of the problems are that there's not yet a, port, uh, a porting guide, which is a bit of a shame. Um, because we've been promising it for a while, and we don't quite have it yet. But, um, but there is really good API documentation. And um, the differences between the two basically boil down to the second point, which is that before, um, before it made sense to do things synchronously. So when you wanted to save the page, you can just wait until the save is done. But in WebKit 2, that, that makes a little less sense, because, because now you're you're sending a message to the web process, which, again, you don't necessarily trust anymore. You know, we're starting to distrust things across the process boundary. Um, and instead of waiting for it, maybe it's better to just to send, send the request, you know, save the page, and when you're done with it, let me know. And what this means is a lot of APIs are asynchronous now. And they look a little bit harder to use. You have to pass a call back and use um, the sort of GIO style, uh, GIO style uh, asynchronous API. So the really tricky bit is that if you were doing some, sign of, some kind of deep integration with the web content, if you were interacting with the page, changing it in real time, then it becomes actually quite a bit trickier. Because before, you could actually reach down into the library and, and modify the actual DOM in memory. But now it's not in memory anymore. It's in some other process. So uh, some other process that you don't necessarily trust. So what you have to do is, is use uh, one of these four, uh, four techniques, uh, injected script source, custom protocols, geobject DOM bindings, or page access via the JSC API. Um, so injected script source is, uh, is essentially uh, 
an API in the web view where you, you give it a string of JavaScript source and you send that to the web process to be executed in the page content, in the page context, and the resulting JavaScript return value will be serialized and sent back to you. So you can imagine uh, writing a small JavaScript program to walk the, the elements of the page and uh, do some processing, maybe find, say, the password field, the contents of the password field, um, and getting back a string from the web process. Uh, and that looks a bit like this. Um, you call WebKit WebView run JavaScript with the WebView, and then this string here is actually the, uh, the script that you write, and then you give it a callback. Pretty simple. Um, and then in the callback, you call WebKit WebView run JavaScript finish, like GIO again, and you get this serialized return value. And everything below that is, is getting the actual JavaScript core values from the return value. This, these funky uh, JS APIs are the JavaScript core API. This is like the API for, for touching uh, the JavaScript engine itself. Um, but you can see that we're just converting this value into a string and then converting that string into a C string. Yeah. It's, it's a little bit of a, of a pain and a bit verbose, but, uh, but really, like, other than this callback, it's similar to what you would do before. Um, so before I talk about um, ah, right, custom protocols, so um, maybe you've used uh, Chromium before, maybe, and you type about, and you get a, a web page. And it's almost like instead of HTTP, you're using this, this about protocol. And that's exactly what custom protocols are. Um, it's, it's that you're, you're integrating with a networking library to add a new protocol to the, uh, to the web engine. Um, and not only can you, can you access pages by loading them, you can actually uh, use AJAX to, uh, to interact with the, with the UI process. For instance, you can, uh, for instance, we have a, in Epiphany, we have a page about plugins. And um, it's not there yet, but eventually there'll be a button that says disable. And what that could do is it could send an AJAX request to the protocol. And when it gets that request, it processes it as if it was a web server, again, um, to disable the plugin without reloading the page. Uh, the big issue with this is that it's a web browser and it's subject to same origin security restrictions, which essentially means that if you're doing AJAX or unloading resources, there are restrictions for accessing resources in another, another uh, scheme host port triplet, uh, which means that if you try to access a cust uh, this, your custom protocol uh, from a web page on HTTP, then it's not going to work. It's going to be a security blocked by the security restrictions. Um, don't disable those. So this is what, what this looks like now. Uh, again, uh, we're just sort of registering this about protocol, and again, with just a callback. And what happens here is that, um, is that we get the request, and we can read the different properties of the request, uh, the path. Um, and here I'm just using the path to print out a response, and I'm sending the response back to the browser uh, as if I was a web server. Um, so before I talk about the other ones, I want to talk about um, web extensions. Um, so web extensions are, are essentially the way that we have exposed some of the more common techniques of interacting with a page uh, uh, in this multi-process environment. Essentially, it's just a shared object that um, the web process finds and loads in its own address space. So um, you don't have to do any IPC, really, if you're just working inside the confines of the web extension. It's a bit like a plugin that loads in the web process. Um, 
And uh, so you can do things synchronously, like walk through the DOM, and it won't block the UI process at all. We're not, the UI process maybe doesn't even know. Um, and you don't have to worry about the, the overhead of IPC or, um, or not. And it's great because you have actual direct access to the DOM objects just like you did before. Uh, and it's written on top of this, this sort of common idea of an injected bundle, which is something that WebKit 2 exposes in, in all ports. Um, sometimes inside a web extension, you want to communicate with the UI process, uh, in which case you could just use dbus or whatever you, you want, in fact. Um, uh, typically, we use dbus. Uh, this is sort of what that looks like. Uh, so I created this source file with uh, this uh, WebKit web extension initialize, which is sort of like the default, the name of the, the entry point to the, uh, to the shared object. And what happens is once we compile this into a shared object um, and set the extensions directory, you'll find the shared object and it'll load it and it will just call this, this function. Um, and... You can print, but also you can use gobject DOM bindings, which um, I guess I should probably explain those a little bit too, uh, if you're not familiar with those. So essentially, um, there's the DOM, and if you're familiar with uh, with web development, you use the DOM in JavaScript to access the internal structure of the page. So you can say like, page, give me your your divs, and you can look at all the divs, you can see their contents, you can see all their properties, their CSS properties, whatever. Uh, and that's, that's the JavaScript DOM bindings. What that means is that it exposes these, C, there's, inside their C++ objects, it exposes them to JavaScript. And likewise, we've written gobject DOM bindings, which means that you can walk the DOM with gobject. Um, and that means you can walk the DOM with C or any other language that supports G-object introspection, which is quite nice. Uh, and unfortunately, now that the DOM is in another process, we can't just do that from the, from the uh, UI process anymore. We have to, to do it in the web extension. Um, and again, uh, we see the WebKit web extension initialize function, which, uh, in which we connect to the page created signal of this extension object. So page created is, is like um, you opened a browser tab and now we have a new browser tab. Uh, and here in the callback for page created, we uh, attach to the document loaded signal, which uh, somewhat obviously fires when the document is finishes loading. Um, and at that point, Maybe we read the title using the exact same uh, DOM, DOM binding APIs that we had in WebKit 1. Um, so a few more steps, and we kind of get to feature parity with WebKit 1. So, uh, so at this point, we're weighing the value of all those things I mentioned before, uh, security, stability, not exposing your users, banking information to fishers and scammers. Uh, versus uh, a couple function calls and compiling a shared object. Um, so uh, finally, the most flexible approach, which will be unveiled globally in an upcoming WebKit GTK release, um, uh, is that we can, uh, we can use directly the JavaScript core API to interact with the page. And what this means is that not only can we walk the DOM, but we can make new JavaScript objects that are backed by native code. Say like you make a new object and the page can actually interact with that object. For instance, maybe you want to expose some system functionality to the page. If you're making a hybrid application, for instance, and you want it to be able to like put the screen to sleep or maybe prevent the screen from sleeping if you want your video player application to, to, not, uh, uh, to not go to sleep while it's, uh, while it's playing uh, web video. 
um, what you can do is you can use this API to expose new objects into the, the world of the, the page and have the page JavaScript interact with it, interact with the application. Um, and a, as well as that, you can just execute arbitrary JavaScript in the web process. Um, for this, you need to know the JavaScript core API, um, which isn't actually so complicated. Um, but at some point, we'd really like to be able to, um, to just expose G-objects directly with seed. Um, that's a ways off. But um, this is the most flexible approach. And it's really like, if, if you really need deep interaction with the page, you'll have to do this. Um, all right. So that was the practical section. And I, I hope that it was useful for some embedders to sort of see what's involved with porting to WebKit 2. Um, and I hope I've convinced you that it's worth it. Uh, and, and keep in mind that like, this is not just WebKit TTK. The, the whole web is, is beginning to look like this, multiple processes. And it, it's, a, it's beginning to look like this because the web is beginning to look like an operating system. The web platform is beginning to look like the application platform. And we already use our browsers like this. I mean, many of you probably keep a web browser open all the time with one application running. I mean, that's, that's no different than keeping an application running in your window manager. I mean, the distinction between web applications and applications is, is almost gone. Um, I keep saying it, but it, it's like it's already happened. So, uh, so what's going to happen in WebKit 2 uh, in the future, given this? Uh, the architecture diagram gets a little bit more complicated. Uh, we add more processes because we did it once and it works, so why not keep doing it until we run out of uh, process handles? Uh, so, so what we have here is that um, not only do we have web processes, we have a network process, worker process, storage process. Um, and it seems, you know, at first it seems like a little bit superfluous. Um, to be honest, when I saw this, I'm thinking, like, why so many different processes? But really, it, it, it makes good sense, um, in fact. Uh, because when you think about it, um, we really wanted to sandbox the web process. We, we didn't want it to be able to, to read the disk or um, even access the network. You know? maybe, maybe, uh, maybe it's dangerous to allow arbitrary code execution to, to talk to the network. Um, and one interesting thing is that um, the way WebKit 2 works now is when, when, when the web process crashes, all your tabs crash. And really, it would be nice if it was like Chromium, where when a tab crashed, it was just that tab. So that means we need multiple web processes running, uh, which means that they're all trying to talk to the network, which should be fine. They could do that separately. But once they talk to the network, they take all their data and they try to put it into the cache, and they try to write to the cookie store, and maybe that cookie store is shared among the different web processes, which means that we start having like contention issues, and we have to worry about multiple writers, multiple readers. So instead of handling all that, we just split out all the networking, all the cookie storage into its own process, and we have all these different web processes talk to this one network process. Likewise. There are APIs in the web platform, quite a few actually, that write to the disk. Um, and if we sandbox the web process to avoid writing to the disk, then those APIs won't work. So instead of having that capability to write to the disk there with this possibly malicious JavaScript code, um, we split out the, uh, the disk access to this worker process, or sorry, to the storage process. And the way that we want to think about like, these process communications, again, is that we distrust the process on the other side. We, we write the code as if, as if that process has already been compromised, as if it's sending us the most evil messages possible. Um, but that's a lot easier than if there was no single point of communication between the processes, if there wasn't just if we had to, to make that decision all the time in the code versus just when we're doing the IPC handling. Uh, this is sort of what I was talking about just now. Um, 
We isolate applications from each other as well as from the UI, prevent the, the web process from crashing all the tabs, just crash you know, that one page. Um, yeah, makes sandboxing a lot easier. Um, the other nice thing about the storage process is that disk access is really slow. So um, there's always some blocking going on. If we, if we always do that asynchronously in another process, there's no issue with that. It could be a thread, but then we couldn't do the sandboxing. And um, that's the future of WebKit 2. And that was my talk. Um, so if there are any questions, I can answer them now. There will be a quiz. All right. 